we need reminded that a girl half the size of Goliath took down David. Someone once said the only reason David was able to beat Goliath was because he didn't have breasts. We've all heard the story about the woman who gets up and gets ready to go to church and her husband has had enough of her choosing God over him and she gets to the door and he pulls a gun and he says, where do you think you're going now? And she says, well, if you pull the trigger, I'm going to heaven. If you don't, I'm going to church. Uh, I liked that story when I first heard it. I like that story. <laughs> I like that story now. Every Mother's Day and on uh, Sarah's birthday, I take the boys to Walmart or one of those Dollar General places. Uh, something where they get to uh, practice buying their mother a present without uh, breaking our bank. Um, so, given that that's where I take them, not surprisingly, I'm sure, I, I don't do that because Sarah particularly longs for the scent of cheap candles or desires yet another small rubber dinosaur or that she gathers around her plastic flowers or that she particularly enjoys Candy that the boys are absolutely certain that she'll like because, you know, well, they like them. But no, I don't do any of that for those reasons. I do it, among other things, to instill a pattern into the lives of the little ones. I do it because I want healthy habits to take root and to flourish. Um, now, I don't want it to be only a pattern. I don't seek to turn them into mindless, ritualistic little robots. I do it to encourage their relationship with their mother because at the giving and the receiving, um, things happen. I, I do it for what hopefully, intentionally lies beyond the pattern. I do it to encourage love. So we're in Genesis 35. Dead and buried. That's what I was going to call the chapter until uh, Jordy alerted me to the Hebrew and I checked a few other translations uh, to see how accurate he was and it turns out accurate. Uh, so now the chapter is going to be called Dead and Buried-ish. God, uh, God calls Jacob to return to Bethel where he was fleeing from Esau and to build an altar and it's going to be quite an affair. Uh, Jacob's mother, Rebecca, uh, her nurse, Deborah, dies and she must have been quite some woman to earn a place. You know, when the When the hired help gets buried and there's a commotion over it, uh, there's a reason for that thing. And, you know, she earns a comment in the book that spares few words. So Deborah dies and was buried. And the words and was buried are particularly important words in this chapter. Buried is what we do with dead things. Life comes from above Dead goes below. It could not be farther from God, death. Uh, light comes down from heaven to illuminate the darkness. That's the order of things. Uh, the city on a hill cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a bushel. No, we put it on a stand. Light and life are from above. Death is down. 
um, <clears throat> the chapter puts the final bow on Jacob being renamed Israel. So to all intents and purposes, Jacob dies and that name is now buried in the past, at least is the hope, which is why we name children, right? Names are sown in hope that the child will live up to uh, what they are called. And God reiterates the blessings to him. He speaks life over Israel, the same life that he spoke over Abraham. And again, he issues the early command that he repeated to Noah to be fruitful and multiply. And not really a command, but a blessing. But um, Israel's wife, Rachel, she also dies while giving birth to Benjamin and was buried, the text says, on the way to Ephrath, Bethlehem. And before she dies, she names her son Benoni, son of my trouble. But Israel, who's just had his past buried and his name changed, decides to do the same thing with his son and buries his, old, his son's old name and renames the child Benjamin, son of my right hand. And then finally Isaac dies and the chapter closes with the words Esau and Jacob buried him. Because that's what you do with the dead. At least that's what we're meant to do with the dead. If we don't do that with the dead, then sickness and illness ensues. So, following slightly on the heels of last week, there is a profound reason for pattern, and especially so when it comes to parenting and the father of us all. You'll never hear anyone, anyone good anyway, uh, commenting on effective parenting without them mentioning consistency. Patterns by their very nature are habit forming, which isn't always a good thing if we enjoy bad habits. But few things will help us develop a healthier lifestyle than forming healthy patterns. Trust me, I'm proving the reverse to be true so that you can all learn from it. <laughs> so when God engages in such things, in such behavior, such example, repeating the same patterns over and over. Be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and, and sets up his people with certain patterns to follow. Then we'd be very silly to overlook such a repetitive flow. It's m more than ritual, of course. But, I mean, even those who despise ritual in effort to escape ritual, form a ritualistic pattern of avoiding rituals. So they're inescapable. It's simply which type of rituals we choose to engage in that makes the difference. And everybody does it. Families do it. We've got birthdays, anniversaries, mealtimes, TV shows, sporting activities, vacations, all these things all patterned into our lives. Uh, when it comes to her children, we got bath time and bedtime patterns, mealtime patterns, church patterns. We have annual celebrations that fall into the pattern of the entire country when all families come together with things like Thanksgiving and Christmas, 4th of July, and a whole host of other things. So it's more than ritual. Families participate in such, thing, such things in order to form familial bonds. Athletes would do it to develop muscle memory and strength. Countries do it to instill patriotism. Schools do it to develop healthy study patterns. And God does it to develop relationship. If all it is is ritual, then we have a problem. In Amos 5, 
after saying to Israel, you turn justice into poison and you throw righteousness on the ground. You hate anyone who speaks out against injustice. You are disgusted by anyone who speaks truth. You trample on the poor. Your crimes are numerous and your sins are many. You oppress the righteous by taking bribes. You deny the needy access to the courts. After saying all of that, God follows up with, So I hate your festivals. I despise them. I'm not pleased with your religious assemblies. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I won't accept them. I won't even look at the fellowship offerings of your choicest animals. Spare me the sound of your songs. I won't listen to the music of your harps. So, throwing the odd sacrifice in God's direction at the appropriate time, in the appropriate manner, in the appropriate dress has never been what God has sought from us. Love loves an earnest desire to have love returned. So this pattern of dying and being buried is of particular interest here. Because it isn't only dead people who are being buried in this chapter. In verse 2 it says, after, God, after being told by God to come to him and worship, change your clothes, it reads, So Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, Get rid of the foreign gods you have with you. Purify yourselves and change your clothes. So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods they had and the rings in their ears, and Jacob buried them. Why? Because that's what you do with dead things. At least that's what we're meant to do. Heaven is up. Life is up. And there is nothing alive in these gods. There's no life in them. In fact, the reverse is true. Death is in them. The least they deserve to be is buried. In Exodus, you'll remember, when Moses goes up Sinai, up Sinai, because heaven is up, life is up, light is up. When Moses eventually descends with the words of life, carrying in his hands light from heaven to shine upon Israel, carrying words from God himself intended to bring life and blessing, he arrives below and finds the people worshipping the golden calf. While talking with God, they're worshipping death. Returning themselves to the slavery they were supposed to be already resurrected from. And the Bible reads, And Moses took the calf. Listen to this for a decision. And Moses took the calf the people had made and burned it in the fire and then he ground it into powder, scattered it on the water, and made the Israelites drink it. Buried wasn't good enough for Moses. He desired the golden calf to be digested into exactly what it was. So Jacob took the gods and buried them. Well, at least they buried them, right? According to the NIV and to the message and a couple of other translations. In all the other translations, the translations that took the time to consider the Hebrew, we discovered that the word actually means hid. He hid the gods underground. And considering the book we are in, Genesis, Hid is not a very favorable word in the context of sin. So to be clear, Genesis 35, 4 actually reads, Jacob hid them under the oak at Shechem. Now Deborah, the nurse, she was also buried 
under an oak. But they named that particular oak, Alon Bakuth, Oak of Weeping. Again, signifying how dear she must have been to them. But no such name for the oak under which the idols were hidden. Well, why would you bury why would you bury the idols under an oak tree while you're on the way up the mountain to offer sacrifice and worship God? Why not just simply bury them in the middle of nowhere where no one would be able to find them? Well, that's the reason, because no one would be able to find them. <laughs> what better than an oak tree to help you find them again on the way back down the mountain? So that you can use them when God's not looking or when God's plan fails. Better to hedge your bets, right? Two gods are better than one. And this is particularly sad because if trees carry such a wonderful symbolic meaning in Scripture, and they do, perhaps even imaging the creation and the creator itself with God as its head. This thing that combines heaven and earth, this one wonderful structure that mediates between heaven and earth with its, with its roots firmly in the ground and its head in the heavens, bringing from the darkness fruit to sustain life. The kingdom of God, says Jesus, is just like a tree with the birds perching on its branches. The tree of life, as you know, opens and closes scripture. And then, of course, we have the great mediation. We have the unmistakable tree of Calvary. The mediation between heaven and earth, standing right in the middle of history as our single pivotal point. So where else would all the lifeless, dead, and worthless gods be except under all that which is good and prosperous and bringing life to us? Except, of course, if they're not buried at all and just hidden for future reference. It's interesting that the exact same action, putting something under the ground, can move from being righteous to being evil based solely on intent of the one doing the burying. Under the ground is the least they deserved. In fact, earlier when Rachel stole the gods from Laban, it was probably worth mentioning back then, but I didn't think about it. But you'll remember in effort to hide those gods, she placed them under her saddle. And I don't mean to be crude, but simply pointing out that that's under her backside. A finer place could not be found for gods. So, and functioning of something as a precursor to Israel's, the nation Israel, functioning as a precursor to Israel's future flirtations and adultery with the gods, they're, they're being taught by Jacob, keep the gods on hand. You never know when you might need them. Not that we would ever need to learn this lesson, of course. This is all purely academic for us. We are too sophisticated for gods now. We would, uh, you'd never find us making alliances with Egypt to secure our own safety, you know, just in case God fails us. No, we, uh, we don't, we don't have gods now in this, not in this century. We are modern. We have, uh, we have healthy things like families and church. We have sport. We go to arenas and watch this. And we live in a completely godless 
society. Because after all, God's, well, let's be honest, that they're just so yesterday. They're so archaic. Who ever heard of anyone <laughs> idolizing their own family? If that was possible, Jesus would have mentioned the danger of loving them more than we do loving him, right? Who ever heard of anyone loving their religion more than God? Even humans couldn't be so foolish as to search scripture because we thought in there we would find eternal life. And who ever heard of anyone ever idolizing a sports team or a singer or a nation or a government? Caesar is Lord and by his decrees we shall live and be prosperous. That's them back then. We'd never say such things. Who ever heard of anyone ever who would agonize over every stroke of scripture when it's God calling for obedience while at the same time jumping through every parental, educational, scientific, governmental hoop without so much as a question. We'd never do that, right? Because, because to obey them quicker than we obey God would be to show God that we trust him less. So as much as we'll research the Hebrew and research the Greek, we're all about that when the world demands our obedience, right? No, we'd never simply hide our gods. When we changed our clothing to become clothed with Christ to cover our garden shame and sin, that meant something. And so as far as we're concerned, hell can release all of its dragons. The world can issue all of its threats. No fire on earth has ever been kindled warm enough. No gun ever pointed at our heads that would ever keep us away from church. We used to be able to say until three years ago. Oh, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's different, that's different. Well, it's always different, isn't it? Always conveniently different when it's our oak tree. And if God had called Jacob on what he did, Jacob, I'm sure, would have had all the, the language of justification already on the tip of his tongue. What? I told everybody we had to get rid of them. I buried them. What more do you want? Always conveniently different when it's our oak tree, when it's our behaviors, our family, our church, our religion, our sports team, our government. Everybody else's can be a problem. Not mine. No, not mine. I do we need reminded that a girl half the size of Goliath took down David. Someone once said the only reason David was able to beat Goliath was because he didn't have breasts. But, but, what, Bathsheba? Bathsheba wasn't a god. Bathsheba didn't even look like a god. We didn't even call her a god. We didn't bury it that deeply. If it was really a God, we would have really buried it. <laughs> so what do we do with this chapter? Can we call it dead and buried? Or do we have to stick with dead and buried-ish? Why would something in Genesis 35, a bunch of nomads... Have us all squirming in our seats 
in 2023. Because as much as we don't like to admit it, the gods have never died. We can always conjure up a saddle or find an oak tree. So we'd be foolish to ignore these stories, particularly as they are precisely the pattern that copied and pasted itself all over history. As I said to my little group on Sunday, when you're betting against God, you're standing on a beach betting against the tide. It's that stupid. I'm a firm believer in the kindness of God being able to work repentance. But 40 days and Nineveh will be destroyed works too. You see, sometimes it doesn't matter how beautiful the boat is. <laughs> Some people in the water need to see the shark <laughs> if they're ever going to be convinced to climb aboard. And although it's wonderful that we have such a God and such a message that people in our state can respond to kindness. And we don't only have a message for them. We also have a message for those children <laughs> who will respond or only respond at the arrival of a father's wrath. Thoughts, comments, questions. Thank you.